This has been an extraordinary year for us at the Innocence Project. We have had nine clients within the past calendar year um, released and or exonerated. And um, six of them have been completely exonerated. Um, we've also helped to secure uh, compensation for, for these six individuals. And yeah. We've also worked successfully to change the compensation laws in Virginia, uh, though admittedly we have a ways to go, but we're making progress. We are thrilled to have um, six clients with us on, uh, at the table for our panel discussion this evening. And these, are, these six are men who were released or exonerated during this past year. Um, importantly though, we have several other released clients in our audience tonight. And the only reason they're not on stage with us this evening is we've got time constraints and space constraints, um, and we're gonna focus on the newly released and exonerated. Um, we'd like to, uh, to acknowledge these, these men and um, their stories, and we'd like to encourage folks to um, engage in conversation, question answers with them afterwards. So I'd like um, to introduce Darnell Phillips. Could you stand up, Darnell? <laughs> Uh, Messiah Johnson and Roje Fentress. Um, we're also grateful to have some other special guests with us this evening. We are honored that the former Secretary of the Commonwealth, Kelly Thomason, and Assistant Commonwealth Secretary uh, Caroline Coral are with us this evening. Um, they work tirelessly along with Governor Northam to make, uh, to make it right for these men up here. And so we and they owe them a debt of gratitude. And we're so happy they're here. Thank you. We also have with us some very important folks from the Virginia Parole Board. Um, we have the new Parole Board Chair, Judge Chadwick Dotson with us, um, who has made it clear that investigating and writing wrongful convictions in Virginia is a priority for this Parole Board, and we are so thrilled and gratified to hear that. We also have the head um, investigator with the Parole Board, Trudy, um, Harris with us this evening. And Trudy, I can't tell you the number of hours and resources that Trudy put into Bobby Mormon's case and Joey Carter's case. Joey couldn't be with us this evening, um, but she is owed a great round of applause for all her work. We also have with us Deirdre Enright, who is the founding director of the Innocence Project um, and worked long and hard on so many of our cases. Deirdre has transitioned into her new role as director for the Project for Informed Reform and the director for the Center for Wrongful, I'm sorry, for Criminal Justice. Um, she wears many hats. And um, we're so thrilled she could be with us tonight. Um, she spent many years working on the cases of several men in this room, and including Emerson Stevens, who was finally exonerated this past summer by Governor Northam. Deirdre also spent countless hours and days and weeks and months and years working on Roger Fentress's case and Messiah Johnson's case. So I'm just gonna tell you how this is gonna work this evening. We're trying to get in, you know, we are fortunate enough to have a lot of clients out here who need to tell their story. We are less fortunate that we've gotta do it within about an hour's time frame. Um, so what we're going to do is give you a brief synopsis of um, our client's case and then ask a few questions of each client. Um, and we hope to end the panel discussion in an hour so that there's time afterward for questions and mingling. Um, and you know we may be able, depending on time, to take questions during the presentation. But um, we're gonna move as fast as we can, but it's hard to tell these stories um, in, in a short amount of time. So. I, like I said, I encourage you to follow up with these folks afterwards um, if, if you want to hear more. Um, I'm going to start by turning the program over to Deirdre, who's going to begin the panel discussion, um, telling us a little bit about Emerson Stevens' case and then, and then having a few um, uh, questions with him. Thanks, Jenny. 
Um, so Emerson came to our client, came to our uh, clinic almost when we opened the doors in 2009. And that we spent the entire time uh, working on his case. It had a lot of ups and downs. We talk about all the time about the number of times we thought we were gonna have to call him and say, we're done. We can't do anything more. There's nothing more to be done. But since no one can ever face that music, we would just pretend that everything was gonna go fine. Um, he was accused, convicted of murdering a young woman in Lancaster County um, in 1986. Yeah, well, and there were two trials, yes. Um, and it was a really, really close-knit community, and it was a very sensational murder. And um, things like that do not happen in Lancaster, and that was part of what went wrong in his case. Um, the community is very, very tight-knit. Um, there's, everyone's related by some degree. In fact, one of his own cousins became a witness against him. Um, and it was, still so sensational when we went there to start investigating that we would start looking at records in the courthouse and by the time we got to the first witness they would say oh yeah we knew you were here already someone already told us you were here um, so word traveled fast um, what happened um, she was found four days after she was murdered in the river she was naked she had cuts on her back um, and there was no hint of anyone who would have that kind of animosity toward her for in the beginning um, a multi-task force formed, the FBI came into town, the state police came into town, the local police came into town, but like most multi-jurisdictional task force, if you don't solve it quickly, they disband, they write a report, they leave town. And in this case, when they left town, um, they left the case with a prosecutor who had just been elected and had never prosecuted a serious felony at all. Um, and the lead detective had also never um, had a case that was serious. So um, the state police had somebody that stayed um, and became kind of the leader and the driver of the train of the investigation. And I'm gonna let Emerson talk about him a little bit because he became the reason why there probably was a conviction um, at all. Um, Emerson, well, innocence cases have pretty much seven red flags for uh, things to go wrong that we see a pattern, it, not just in Virginia, everywhere. Emerson had almost every red flag that there could be. He had junk science, there was prosecutorial misconduct, there was police misconduct, there was, um, there was a number of eyewitness identification. But one problem that Emerson did not have was, we thought in the beginning, was a bad lawyer. Um, we read the transcripts and we thought, this guy fought for him, this guy really liked him, he believed in his innocence. But um, in the end, that kind of went wrong. And I want you to tell everybody why that went wrong. Yes, um, well, because my attorney, trial attorney, uh, they didn't like him because he was not from the area, was one reason. And he was kind of cocky, and he let everybody know it. Uh, so during, when they found me guilty in, in my last trial, he got so hyped up, he kicked the chair and the judge was going to have him arrested. Uh, he told, the, the judge told him, said if he didn't calm down that they would, he would call, find him contempt of court and lock him up. He said, well, he said that was a $100 fine. He said, well, I'll kick it again and you can charge me $200. So, but that's the way my uh, trial attorney was. You know, he was cocky and they didn't like that, you know. Yeah, he, um, when I first met him, uh, he had me and the students at his house, and he, you know, we told him what we were doing. And at the end, he did a sort of a Socratic method um, interview of me. And he said, um, Ms. Enright, why don't you tell me why you think Mr. Stevens was convicted? And I went on about bad prosecutors, bad police, bad detectives, bad everybody. And he said, no, do you want to try again? And I said, um, uh, sure, OK. It was a bad judge. And, it was bad, and, and finally, he said, uh, Ms. Enright, um, he was convicted because I'm an asshole. And I said, okay, well, students, start writing. Let's write this down right now. And he said, you know, I was young, I was new, and I knew I was really good, and I thought I was better than everybody. And he said, and I thought I would show them, I would school this community about how to defend somebody. And he said, and, you know, I didn't think at all about what would, they would hate me, and they would hate my client, too. And when we did go to interview jurors, that was precisely what had happened. And it was something he learned later in his career, um, too late. 
although he never left his side, like for years he stayed um, vigilant about this case. Um, another reason why you're here um, is because of a pesky little old white lady named Beverly Monroe, um, who um, I want you to tell them who she is and why she became your justice warrior. Yeah. Yes, uh, Beverly Monroe is one of my number one fans. Uh, she was also convicted and sent to prison by David Riley, uh, the state investigator, uh, who made up evidence and told lies on her. And she, w she served time in prison also by David Riley, um, which he is a dirty cop. And we don't deserve to be sent to prison because of what they do or how they do or, you know, you could tell him one thing and he didn't want to hear that. He wanted to do everything his way. So they were, and, but Beverly Monroe, she's been a great friend to me. Uh, she is still a great friend. Uh, like I say, she's one of my number one fans and, and she's kind of helped me up for a long. And when they were doing an investigation on my case, she would not let them give up. That's true. And her uh, daughter um, also uh, helped get her mother out of prison. Beverly's daughter became a lawyer and um, later started her own innocence project to exonerate people. Um, so she's another person that we um, should just have a whole event around. Um, um, she also, um, one of the things that um, Dave Riley would do and was plant ideas during the interrogations, plant ideas into the people he was talking to try and force them to say things that they wanted them to say. And so since Emerson wouldn't confess, he thought, well, the best thing I'm probably going to be able to do is get him to change his story somehow. So he said to Emerson, well, maybe you, maybe you stopped on the road near the victim's house. Maybe you were in the area. And he said, no, why would I stop on the road? And he said, maybe, maybe you stopped to urinate. Maybe you would just pull over and stop to urinate. And when he wouldn't stop interrogating him and come to his work and come to his own, finally one day, Emerson said, you know, if somebody saw me there, you're telling me someone saw me there, maybe it's because I stopped to urinate on the road near that. And that became, he's a liar, he was near. Um, the brilliance of that was, um, I can't take credit for it, because there was a woman who covered his case for the Washingtonian Magazine, which you should go read, because there's, it's really well done. But, David Riley wouldn't talk to me when I went to investigate Emerson's case. He said that he had heard about me, and he heard that I twist people's words, which I thought was really funny um, but, and, and ironic. But anyhow, but Marisa went to talk to him, and somehow she um, had magic forces that I did not have. And he told her on the record that he said, oh, that idea of him on the road urinating, and he said, I planted that idea. Like, I gave him that idea as though proudly um, he, had done his, he had done his job. Um, so the truth comes out in many different ways in Emerson's case. Um, so Michael Hash is another exoneree who um, once told me that one of the biggest problems for him was that because everyone was so sure he would be found innocent, no one had ever told him about what prison would be like. And I don't know if that was true for you or if that happened, but I wonder if anyone Gave you any information or advice about going to prison? Nobody? No. Um, tell them about how much time you ended up serving for the crime. I served uh, 31 years, 10 months, and one week uh, for a crime that I have nothing to do with. Um, my time in prison, was, but no one told me what prison life was like. Um, I, you know, it was, it was rough. Being in prison with other people that I know that had committed their crimes, um, it's, it's very hard to deal with. Uh, being in, in the same rooms with them, same cell with them, sleeping with them, and you know, in different double bumps. And, but it was terrible, it was rough. It was something I do not, do not want to experience ever again. Um, and like I say, this is about it. being out of prison is great, and I can thank the Innocent Project. They are great people. They do their job, and we are all examples. Right down the line, we are all examples.
examples of what went wrong in our cases and the Innocence Project worked hard to get us out. And I thank God and I thank these people, innocent people, innocent project. Yeah, UVA, they the best. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emerson. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, so I'm, I'm Juliette Hatchett, and I am going to talk to Lamar Barnes next, who's seated um, two seats to my left and appears to be filming me. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> Lamar um, and Bobby, can you hand him a microphone? Um, Thank so you, Thank Lamar you. was convicted of a Portsmouth, Virginia murder in 2002. Um, it was a devastatingly brutal crime. Um, a pregnant woman was shot in the head and killed, um, and her partner, the father of her child, was also shot in the head and miraculously survived. Um, there were two juveniles who were also at the house when this happened, um, in and one of them was stabbed and the other was injured. Um, so the two juveniles survived um, and the crime was definitely committed by two people and one of them was pretty immediately identified um, and it was a man named Michael Artis who is Lamar's cousin. Um, it was pretty clear from the start that Michael Artis was the man who had um, interacted with the two juveniles who'd been stabbed and that a different person had been the shooter. Um, and Lamar was identified as the shooter. Um, we now know uh, by kind of just a mistake of fate, um, largely because Lamar spent a lot of time with his cousin, Michael Artis. Um, we've now reviewed, had the opportunity to review the files in the case and we can see that Lamar's name was first mentioned because someone who had been to the house before said, I've seen Michael at the house with Lamar before and that became Lamar was the guy who was with Michael that day. The train sort of got out of the station and never stopped from there. Um, at trial, the two juveniles who were 14 and 15 and were threatened with possession of marijuana charges um, both testified against Lamar. Um, they both identified him, although with varying degrees of, um, of certainty. They have both subsequently said that they acted under um, severe threats and pressure. They were obviously extraordinarily young and had been through something extremely traumatic. Um, the surviving man who was shot also identified Lamar, but we now know that before trial, he had expressed um, quite a bit of doubt about that identification and the prosecution was aware of that at the time. Um, he was also facing charges at the time, and what we now know from the years of investigation that we've done is that the charges against him were being manipulated. Um, a special prosecutor had been brought in to come and, and um, prosecute the case against him. Since he was the primary witness in a murder, uh, the prosecution in Portsmouth had a conflict of interest when it came to his case. So they brought in a prosecutor from another jurisdiction. What we now know, we've seen internal emails showing that there was coordination between the two offices to make sure that um, when Mr. Barnes was at trial, this main witness, whose name was Mark King, would have charges hanging over his head um, and you know, would do what the prosecution wanted him to do, identify the correct person, and then the charges would be dropped afterward. Um, and in fact, the charges were dropped and when before the trial, and when Mark King started to express some discomfort with the idea that he had to testify against Lamar, uh, Mark King was re-indicted. Um, we ultimately were able to get access to all of the prosecution's files in this a couple of years ago because the Commonwealth's attorney in the city of Portsmouth um, let us into her office and was willing to hear us out. And she said, this sounds like a terrible case. I want you to have access to everything you need. At the time, she was not legally required to give us access to her files. She is now because of a law that um, we actually worked on a couple of years ago that changed the Freedom of Information Act in Virginia. Um, but we were able to get access to a lot of information that at the time was not required and it's an example of when prosecutors wanna right wrongs, what can happen. Um, so we, uh, with the help of a, student, a former student who's here now, Simone Rousseau, who was obsessed with this case and would not let it go, um, we decided to file a petition for writ of habeas corpus um, in addition to a petition for writ of actual innocence in Lamar's case. 
Um, around the same time, the former Attorney General, Attorney General Herring, formed a Conviction Integrity Unit in Virginia, which was designed to look into cases where we thought there was a faulty conviction and um, to investigate them and determine whether or not uh, you know, they could move forward in trying to get someone exonerated. Um, so we took this case to the Conviction Integrity Unit and said, like, here's a gift, please, please work on this. Um, and we have one of the attorneys from the CIU here, Emily Hasbrook, who worked very hard on this case. Um, ultimately, the Attorney General agreed that this man was obviously innocent um, and agreed to join in the litigation, meaning that when we took his case into court, no one was opposing us. The state was saying, we agree, um, he should be exonerated. So we filed in court, um, and then some other people who are here were also doing a lot of hard work on this and reviewing the absolute pardon petition that was also pending. And on, was it January 4th, Lamar? Wow. On January 4th, Lamar received an absolute pardon and walked out of prison after 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so Lamar, I wanna talk about one of the extraordinary things about Lamar's case is that um, one of the victims in the case, this man, Mark King, who'd been shot in the head, um, felt awful about what had happened and the role that he had played in Lamar's conviction. And for years, he was writing to anyone who would listen and asking, for help. Um, so Mark King wrote to senators, he wrote to us, he wrote to everyone he could. Um, that's not really something that we see very frequently. Um, he specifically told us he'd go to prison if he had to, to help. Um, and so Lamar, I wanted to ask you kind of, that's a very unique thing about your case, and how did it feel for you when you found out that one of the victims was, was on your side and wanted to make sure that um, you got justice? Good question. Uh, how y'all ladies and Thanks. gentlemen doing today? Um, <laughs> Well, I wasn't surprised because I had received a letter from him in the mail, and he was telling me, like, all the organizations that he reached out to, like, even how the prosecutor told him that, you know, if you testify on him, we'll drop your charges, and he did it because he didn't want to go back to prison. So, to me, it was kind of understandable because, you know, the first law of nature is self-preservation. Anybody going to take care of itself in any situation, but there's certain codes and things that you shouldn't do. So I guess he felt as though he was wrong, even though his daughter may have disabilities and maybe even though his wife may have passed away, but he knew he was wrong in the process. So at the end of the day, I respect him for that. So was I surprised? No. But was I relieved? Yeah. So I just, I appreciate him for that. You know, he could have you know, when you shot in the head and you're dealing with disabilities too, like, you might want to feel like revenge against somebody, whoever it may be. So he could have felt like that, but he didn't. He took the right route, and I appreciate it. So that's how I feel about that. Uh, Mark King has unfortunately passed away in 2020, uh, but uh, we were able to get his statements on video, um, and he, he gave sworn declarations, um, and one of the... One of the really um, devastating things about this is that we weren't able to get Lamar out in time for him to meet Mark King. Um, I would love for Mark to be here today telling his story. Um, Lamar, could you also talk about, I know when we took your case to the Conviction Integrity Unit, um, we were talking to you all the time, keeping you updated. Um, and when you found out that the, the CIU you know, saw your case, agreed with it, um, was going to join in. What, what was that like? Was that a weight off your shoulders? Mm -hmm. I feel like I can hug my mama again. <laughs> um, yeah, I think at, at that time, we sort of, we knew that if we could go into court and there's no one opposing us, um, that was the best case scenario. So there was a lot of pressure around that um, and a lot, of, a lot of back and forth about what was going to happen, but that was, that was a big big moment in the journey that was your exoneration. Really Y'all yeah. pop me if I get emotion. I do it every time. It's okay. Um, all right, I don't want to make you cry, but. <laughs> you already did. <laughs> <laughs> it's joy. Can you talk a little bit about um, your relationships with the students here at UVA and um, what it was like working with students who were um, volunteering their time for your case. Lamar's case, the first year that it was investigated um, was with our academic clinic, and the second year that it was investigated, it was with our volunteer pro bono clinic, which is the one that 
we're fundraising for tonight. Um, and some student, two of the students who were on Lamar's case were so invested in it that you can't take the academic clinic twice in a row. The American Bar Association won't allow us to do that. So these two students um, took the case to the pro bono clinic, the, their third year of law school, and said, we're going to see this out. Um, and then we didn't quite finish it that year. And so one of the students then went to a law firm and said, I'm going to continue working on this pro bono at a law firm, um, and ultimately was able to do that. So could you talk about that a little bit? I really don't want to talk about it, but I do want to do a stand <laughs> ovation, though. Okay. <laughs> she knows she's special. I don't want to. I'm crying already. But she's a she's a dynamic woman. Um, you said she was scary the first time you met her. I ain't gonna say she was scary. She just had a determined look that she didn't want to look back. And I appreciated that. I told her from the first day I seen her, she just looked very determined. I like that about her. But she's a very nice woman. She stayed down. She she could have went and worked for anybody, but she stayed here. I think I recall you saying you kind of wish she was your lawyer because she was more intimidating than I was. <laughs> Why you do that? <laughs> but. I really don't have nothing to complain about. I had 628 years. That, that was my reality. I ain't never think I'll be sitting in front of y'all for free. I ain't pay nobody. You got people all here paying for lawyers. You can't even get out. These people did it for free. Dedicated each time. I appreciate it. it won't fall, I won't even be a Tony, y'all. So I appreciate all y'all. I really do. So I'm at Juliet, your university, everybody that contribute to seeing us all here. I appreciate y'all. I really do. Amen. That's all I got Thank to say. you. <laughs> I can't, I can't <laughs> keep talking. I'm gonna stop making you cry now. <laughs> But these tears of joy, though. <laughs> these tears of joy. These, look, I ain't boo to nobody. These just tears of joy, because I appreciate y'all so. And I don't cry in front of people. I never cried not one time in prison. Not one time. But since I've been home, I can't name not one day <laughs> that I ain't cried. But it's pain that you had for 20 years. You don't get a chance to express that in prison. You can't do it. So now it's just like I'm a fountain. I just be running. But I don't care though. I laugh, I smile at it. I don't look at this being negative or nothing like that. I just look at it as joy. I just appreciate like, I feel like I'm, I'm, I, I, I've been born again. I was 19 when I got incarcerated. I'm 40 now. So I spent half my life in prison, half my life on the street. So what am I, 20? Or what I feel like? I ain't seen no 20s or 30s in society. I seen it in prison. So I made prison my university. I learned everything I can learn. Since so this is where I'm gonna be, I might well learn everything I can learn. I got my own business now. I haven't been compensated yet. I got driver's license. I never had a driver's license in my life. <laughs> I feel good when I ride past the police. <laughs> Let's be honest. All right, Lamar, I'm gonna but stop making you cry now. I know y'all gotta go and somebody <laughs> gotta speak, but that's right. my story. I appreciate y'all for listening. <laughs> God bless you. Yeah. Lamar, now you made everybody cry. <laughs> All right, Gilbert, I'm gonna it's do my best soul. not to make you cry. Uh, so this is Gilbert Merritt. Um, Gilbert is from Norfolk, Virginia, where he was convicted in 2001 of a murder that he did not commit. Um, Gilbert was uh, pro Gilbert was investigated by an officer who has subsequently um, been exposed as having been corrupt for many years. Um, his name is Robert Glenn Ford. He was a Norfolk detective for uh, on the homicide squad for decades. Um, 
it came out in the early 2000s that Detective Ford had been taking bribes in exchange for making charges go away against people. Um, he would take bribes and then show up in court and testify and say that the person had you know, served as a, an informant in a case and in exchange they should grant leniency um, when that had not happened. Um, he was ultimately found guilty of uh, several different felonies and sentenced to, I believe, 12 and a half years in prison. Um, and recently completed that sentence. Um, so we have investigated a number of cases involving this officer, um, including the case of Arsene Hicks, who is still in prison, and I hope very much that um, at one of these events in coming years, he will be here to tell his story. Um, Ford was the detective who investigated Gilbert's case. Um, there was only one thing connecting Gilbert to the case, which was the word of a woman who said that Gilbert had confessed to her. Um, she had an extraordinary amount of detail about the crime. Um, she also was facing 80 years um, in Norfolk on drug charges. She was also facing a probation violation in Virginia Beach. Um, so this woman had a lot to gain by testifying um, against Mr. Barrett. There was no physical evidence. There were no eyewitnesses who um, put him at the scene. There was no other witness. It was solely a confession case. Um, and this witness's testimony was bolstered solely by Detective Ford. That was the entire case against Gilbert. Um, the first time I read the transcript, I kept thinking, like, okay, so now there's going to be evidence when I turn the next page. Um, and it wasn't there. It never came. Um, so uh, many years later, uh, the woman who testified against Gilbert came forward and said that she had lied. Um, she said that Robert Glenn Ford had fed her this story and that she was terrified of dying in prison. Um, she was a mentally ill addict who had served time before but not serious time um, and was facing 80 years. Um, so she came forward, met with us, gave a statement, um, and swore that the whole, the whole story had been false. Um, so we ultimately filed a petition for writ of habeas corpus in Norfolk Circuit Court, um, and we were granted discovery, and at that point we were very fortunate that McGuire Woods came on to help with the case. I know some folks from McGuire Woods are here tonight. Um, they have been absolutely invaluable in this case and also in Mr. Hicks's case in Norfolk. Um, so Gilbert's case is still pending, um, but while we've been litigating it, we were also um, advocating for Gilbert to receive a conditional pardon or an absolute pardon um, while this litigation was ongoing. Um, and in January of this year, Gilbert was granted a conditional pardon. So what that means is that Gilbert is released, but he is not exonerated. The murder conviction is still on his record. Um, if we are successful in the habeas petition that is pending now, his um, conviction would be vacated. So. Gilbert's case is a little different than these others because it is still very much live, very much pending. Um, we were just in court and in having an evidentiary hearing um, last month, and we're briefing that, uh, post-hearing briefing now. Um, so Gilbert served 20 years? 20 years. Um, and was released in January. And Gilbert, I'm wondering if you could talk about, um, you know, something we hear a lot is how difficult it is to fight your case when you're in prison versus when you're out of prison. Um, and you're one of the lucky few who is now getting to fight while you're out of prison. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how different it is now that you're out to be able to you know, meet with us in person and not schedule a, a jail call that lasts, or a prison call that lasts for 20 minutes and then gets cut off. Uh, it's extremely different, you know. One thing I learned, like when I first got incarcerated, my main thing was, okay, I was uneducated to the law. So when you are educated to the law coming from a, where I come from, you know, it's easily to be misled or, you know. So I, I'm, read, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading, I'm reading. And one thing I learned in, in the Black Law Dictionary, it says ignorance to the law is no excuse. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So right then and there it tells you regardless of what's going on, you know, either you know your surroundings or you don't period, point blank. And in the Commonwealth, common, it, it, you break the word down, it's exactly what it is. You got to either be common or you got to be wealthy. That's how I look at it. You know what I'm saying? So, but I tried to fight it from the inside and, and, and trying to understand the language of the law is, is, is 
it was beyond my comprehension at the time. You're talking about somebody who never graduated from high school. So I had to go back and go to school first just to understand reading per se. Like you could read, but you got to comprehend reading. You know what I'm saying? So I had to go back to school just to learn how to read and comprehend. So it wasn't working for me. And by the time I en ended up learning everything I learned, the time had expired. So me fighting my case was hard. So I had to reach out for help. You know, I had to put my pride in my back pocket. So when I put my pride in my back pocket, I reached out to the Innocence Project. And it, it, it was a process. I'm, I'm, I'm always scratching. I always say this. I say, I'm not that lucky. You know, I always say that I'm not that lucky. It's not going to happen. The letter come through the door. I'm like, ah, somebody love me. <laughs> you know, I, I, it, I always say this. Remember I said this. You know what I'm saying? I, 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 somebody love me. You know what I'm saying? So I filled the paper. I sent it back. I never forget it. I, I come off Wallace Ridge, they send me the nod away. I get the nod away and Juliet comes see me. And she sat down with me and it was like a sense of relief. Like, cause every day in the institution, it's like my chest is tight, my stomach tight. Like you just plain pissed off for you being in a situation you have no business being in, you know? But God gives you ease. At the difficulty comes ease. And that ease walked through the door when I seen her and she sit there and she comforted me and she told me, like, we gonna do all we can. I said, that's all I asked you to do. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, somebody believed in me, you know, other than my family. I, that's all I look for, somebody else to believe in me other than my family. My family gonna be there whether it's hard times or good times, but somebody outside of that to actually show love, genuine love for you. And it wasn't just her, it was a whole team. So, you know, from then on, regardless of what happened, I was comfortable at that situation. So, but we was trying to, we was trying to figure out how to navigate it behind it while I was locked incarcerated, which was incredible hard because the gadgets y'all got out here compared to what's in there, it's like Flintstones to, <laughs> to Jetsons, you know? So I come out here and it's, they try to give me a phone and I can't even, I, I just want a flip phone. Everybody tell me I'm outdated, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but it, it's different. So, so when I come out here and we start to strategize and fight the case, I, I, I look at the world, it's totally different now. Like I'm more, I'm more educated with the law out here than I was in there and I thought I was good in there. I wasn't even nowhere near it. All I was good at is what the rule handbook said. <laughs> so yeah, it's extremely well. Um. And Gilbert, you know, one of the extraordinary things about your case is that it involves um, an officer who we know to be quite corrupt, um, who, has, who has served prison time. Um, and I'm wondering, what's it like for you to know um, that someone went to prison for the things that he did in cases like yours, um, but also that he's already out? See, that's the problem. You know, by us being human, we, 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 we prone for error, you know? And they say the divine thing about that, what God instilled in us is forgiveness. But for an individual to take an oath and commit atrocities the way he done and allow him to skate unscathed the way he did, you know, it's still no real penalty for what he's done. I, I don't know what else to say about that one. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, all right, I'm going to throw you a softball, and then I'm going to leave you alone. Uh, <laughs> what's been the most surprising thing about reentry after 20 years, besides flip phones now being little I got screens? An iPhone now. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, just just getting a whole adjustment to being in society as a citizen, as they say, you know, Medicaid job. You know what I'm saying? 401, you know, all these things I never thought about in my life, you know, driving, you know, home, you know, all, all these things is, is coming. It's coming in a slow process. It, it, it's hard. It's extremely hard, you know, but I got a, I got a good support system with the family. Tell me, stick it in and stay, stay focused. Keep your head up, chin out. But, you know, it's all right. I ain't complaining. <laughs> I'd rather have these problems than them problems. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Gilbert. Uh, <laughs> All right, I'm going to turn to Javon Tillman before I hand it over to Jenny, um, and I'm sure we're running over time, but I'm doing the best I can. Um, 
So Jervon is uh, from Richmond, Virginia. Um, and Jervon was convicted of the armed robbery of a pizza delivery man in Henrico. Um, and something that we know because we have DNA evidence in um, innocence cases is that in 70% of uh, wrongful convictions in which there's DNA proving, you know, beyond any question in the world that the person is innocent, in 70% of those cases, there's a mistaken eyewitness identification. Mistaken eyewitness identifications are by far and away the most common factor that leads to wrongful convictions. And one of the difficult things about them is that there's often absolutely no bad intent. There's just a mistake that's made. Um, and it's very difficult to undo a mistake. Um, if someone commits perjury intentionally, they might have a crisis of conscience years later. But someone who's made a mistake um, and, and believes that they did the right thing uh, can't have that sort of change. Um, so we see uh, mistaken identifications in quite a few of our cases, including Jervon's. Um, but Jervon's case, I think, has the most startling mistaken eyewitness identification I've ever seen. Um, Jervon, will you stand up for me? So <laughs> Jervon is six foot three, um, and he's a trim man. Uh, you can sit back down now. Um, <laughs> The uh, individual, the, the victim of the, of the robbery, described his attacker as 5'10 and a stocky build, um, which I think is pretty clearly not Jervon. Um, and the perpetrator of the crime um, that Jervon was convicted of was carrying a gun um, and was partially masked. So his face was partially obscured. You couldn't, couldn't really make an identification of this person. Um, and the presence of the gun is significant because guns create what's called the weapon focus effect, which makes it much more difficult for individuals to recognize and accurately perceive the person who's actually holding the gun. Um, the, the victim in this case said that he could recognize um, Jervon because of his eyes. So most of this perpetrator's um, face had been covered, but the eyes were visible. And he said that Jervon's eyes looked like Mike Singletary's eyes. And I had to Google who Mike Singletary was, but apparently he was a somewhat famous football player at some point in time. Um, so when we saw this case, um, you know, I thought, I thought it was just nutty. I couldn't believe that this was the whole, the whole thing. It was one eyewitness. That was the entire case. Um, the person had also, the, the victim had also um, identified Javon in a highly suggestive way. Um, he, had, he had found him on a, on a list of wanted individuals. Um, Javon has, you know, uh, but this was a crime he did not commit. Um, so we got involved in the case, saw that it was, you know, just a wildly um, inaccurate and problematic eyewitness identification with pretty much every um, red flag that you can have. Um, and so started working on it and eventually decided that the best way to advocate for Jervon was through an absolute pardon um, because the legal mechanisms available to him on this kind of scant evidence without a witness who understood that he'd made a mistake um, was going to be very difficult. Um, so we advocated for an absolute pardon, and Jervon received an absolute pardon in January 2022. Um, and so, so Jervon, one of the questions I have for you is, um, when you were going into court and you knew the only evidence against you was you know, one eyewitness identification. Um, oh, and I should add that the initial description of the perpetrator, um, it appears, was not actually turned over to the defense at the time of trial, so um, losing the ability to cross-examine on, on that. Um, but Jervon, did you think there was any way you'd be convicted on that evidence? I was so sure I wouldn't be convicted. I told my family not to even come. <laughs> Seriously. You know, I told them not to even come. You know, I'm like, when I go in this courtroom, whoever this guy is, when he see me, even with a mask on, I didn't know what he had said the guy looked like before me or nothing. I was like, man, when this man see me, he guaranteed he gonna be like, man, I don't think I'm, something against saying that it's me. And that man was looking at me like, he had seen me his whole life, and I had never seen this man before in my life. So, you know, I'm kind of like, now I'm thinking like, you know, I never put a defense up because I didn't, I didn't think about even putting a defense, even though I asked my mom, did she remember where I was at at the time because they, gave, they finally gave me a date when they said it happened. So, 
My mom was like, yeah, you remember you was uh, at the house, so I had to keep you at the house, you had to get your daughter off the bus for those days. I'm like, yeah, I remember I was at the house. I said, me, you, me, you, my sister and my mom, we was sleeping downstairs, I remember. She's like, yeah, and you left and got on the bus the next day. So boom. I'm telling my lord, you know what I'm saying? I'm like, man, you know, I know where I was at at the time, but he was like, you don't need that, you good, you know? They, they don't got nothing, they saying, you know? Going there, the judge started speaking Japanese, I ain't know how, what's, how much time he gave me. I'm like, man, what he say? The lord, he like, I'm gonna tell you when you get in the back. They take me, you know? <laughs> so Javon had a bench trial and was sentenced to 25 years, but it was, it was an extraordinarily long sentence um, for the crime, and um, Javon, you served, I believe, we calculated about eight and a half of those years um, before your release. Um, Javon, did you ever consider taking a plea deal in that case? Never. Why Not is that? Once. Even if they just said I went home that day, I would, my mind would have never, the way I am inside, I never would take no, why would I, why would I do that? Y'all need to find out who, do that, who did that. I ain't got nothing to do with that. The law said, if I do 100 crimes, then I can convict them 100 crimes. If 101 crimes get committed, I don't get convicted of, of that extra crime. But that's not what happened. These people convicted me of all the crimes, they didn't care. Like I said, I don't never claim to be this type of man that never did anything. Yeah, I've done things that I'm not proud of, but I didn't commit this crime, so that's what I'm telling them. But they ain't care. Yeah, and one of the problems in Javon's case that we see in a lot of cases is that when a person gets wrapped up in the criminal justice system, they become more likely to be wrongfully convicted. Um, once you're in the system, once your mugshot's in the system, once you're known to officers, um, you're much more likely to be sus suspected of a crime that you, you didn't commit. Um, and in this case, that's, that's exactly what happened. And I think that, um, you know, Javon, your case illustrates the importance of recognizing that um, to be innocent of one crime, you, know, you, you don't have to be um, perfect from your whole life. Like everyone who is wrongfully convicted of something they didn't do is deserving of um, justice and, and release. Um, and in fact, I think we need to be paying attention to the fact that we are more likely to wrongfully convict people who are wrapped up in the, in the criminal justice system. Um, Javon, how's it been since you got out? Great. <laughs> I am serious. I'm talking about like sometimes I'll be alone a lot because like the transition from being in prison to being out here, you start to learn that that place really messes your psych up. So you have to learn how to adapt to, a, I can say, a normal, you know what I mean? So a lot of times now I'm still alone, but I'm happy. I'm very, very happy. And it seemed like and this is the beginning, I don't know, it's just a, it's a, like bro say sometimes, like I might just get up in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, can't go by to sleep, but I'm just so excited, and go walk down the street and might be, might be crying. But I ain't crying because I'm sad, and I ain't crying, like, I ain't like having it either. You know, I, ain't, I don't really want nobody to see me, but at the same time, I'm happy, man, I'm free. You know what I mean, those people finally gave me a second chance, when I shouldn't even have to ask for a second chance. But I got it, I'm out here. So, I ain't, I ain't, I ain't got no complaints. I'm just glad that, the world made a Juliet and a Serena, you know, I'm just, I'm just blessed for that, for real. So, and um, the uh, co-founder down there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Man, well, thank y'all, everybody, who, you know, and even the people that's not got out yet, they gonna need y'all, because it's, it's more people in there. It's not a lot, it's a whole lot of people in that line say they ain't did nothing, but it's some, it's some people in there that didn't do it, and they need to get out here too, they need to feel this. All right, thank you, Javon. All right, we're going to talk with Bobby Mormon next. How you doing, Bobby? <laughs> Get the mic in front of gotcha. you. So Bobby was convicted of um, a drive-by shooting in Norfolk um, in the 1990s. Uh, fortunately, no one was injured, no one was hit. Um, and Bobby was convicted based on the testimony from the, the three witnesses who were um, supposedly targets of, of the drive-by. Um, Bobby's case is pretty extraordinary because at Bobby's trial, the actual shooter and every other person in the car that night testified and said, I was the one that fired the gun and we were the ones in the car and Bobby was not with us. Bobby had nothing to do with this. Bobby also presented his alibi. He was playing video games at the 7-Eleven 
nearby. Nonetheless, he was convicted and he was sentenced to 48 years in prison. Bobby served over 20 years in prison before he was released on parole in 2016. Um, so Bobby has been out, I think, longer than anyone else up here this evening um, for about six years. And um, Bobby, I want to go back. I imagine that it was pretty darn shocking that you were convicted based on evidence um, at your trial when the actual shooter testified that he did it and you had nothing to do with it. Can you even begin to answer the question of how or why you were convicted of this crime? No, no, no I, I can't answer the question. Like, I don't know. <laughs> and the, when the judge sentenced you, um, after you were convicted, you continued to profess your innocence. And at the sentencing, the judge took offense to that. Do you remember what he said? Mm. What did he say, Mom? <laughs> I don't remember. Somebody bring the ceiling down or something? I don't know. He said something about a ceiling. Oh, Mama crying. That's why I don't like talking about it. But anyway, you say like he'll bring the courthouse down on me or something. I don't. The judge seemed to be offended that you continued to profess your ignorance um, and, and sentenced you to an extraordinary sentence, um, particularly for a crime in which no one was injured. Um, so, Bobby, like I said, you've been out for about six years now. Can you talk a little bit about what the struggles were when you first were released and, and what your life has been like? Since your release? Yeah, well, uh, man, like I'm rapping to some of this microphone, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm a rapper. What's up? No, I'm joking. But anyway, <laughs> now you got to laugh. But, uh, I don't, you know, when I first came home, it was, uh, I can't, you can't really like, it's like hard to explain to people that like never really done time. I went in 18, I came out 41. So like coming home, I came home to like a new world. And like prison mess you up mentally. So I got like PTSD, I got, um, but I don't take medicine for it. So it was like, it was hard. You know what I'm saying? I stayed straight. Thanks to my family, because my parents, they were there the whole time. You know what I'm saying? Innocent Project, Parole Board, you know, Trudy, all of them, they, they helped me out a lot. But it's, you know, it was hard, but that's the past. I'm here now, I'm in front of y'all. I love the Anderson Project, and I'm forever in debt to them. And you know, it's about the right now. Right now, I'm good, I'm working. You know what I'm saying? I ain't been in no trouble. I've been home over six years. Went in 18, came out 41. I'm sitting in front of y'all now. So, you know, I'm good, you know. Bobby, in January and February of this year, um, you were part of a group of folks who were had to advocate for your compensation before the General Assembly um, in order to get compensation for your wrongful conviction. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like to have to argue that you should be compensated? Mm, well, it was a new world. It was like, I don't know. I ain't going to say it was, put it this way, it was different. It was, I'm in front of like, what, Republicans, Democrats, liberals, or whatever. But no disrespect, I don't know if there's no Republicans in the audience, but the Republicans <laughs> weren't that cool. But the Democrats were all right. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Some Republicans were cool, though. <laughs> it was cool, though. I, I had a good time. It was, it was cool. You know? <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm sorry if I offended anybody. But, <laughs> and Bobby, you were finally exonerated um, uh, last summer. Can you talk a little bit about how you you feel or hope or think your life's going to change since the exoneration? You know, it, it was good. I'm glad they recognized that I was in there with something I didn't do. But, like, money is not going to replace the time I was going for my family. You know what I'm saying? Or the almost 23 years I've spent in prison. It's going to help, but what people don't get it, it really don't change nothing. It's going to help me yeah. but and my family, but, you know, I it's cool. It's good. I feel good that the governor did that. I salute him for that. You know what I'm saying? But it like above all, I salute like my family, Innocent Project, and the Virginia, uh, Virginia Parole Board, and News Channel Three, and whoever else like was really down for me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. 
Yeah, I said Trudy. Well, <laughs> Ma, you can't. I'm going to get Trudy in trouble. You cannot say Trudy. You got to say parole board. The boss is here. <laughs> my, mama, my, my mama let everybody know. Trudy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Bobby. Okay. Lamont. Laurent, Lamont, pull on up to the mic. Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to next introduce um, Lamont Madison, who uh, is our most recently released client. He has been out for just about two months now, and he was released on parole. Lamont was um, convicted of a 1997 robbery in Norfolk um, and Virginia, I'm sorry, Virginia Beach. And he was sentenced to 28 years in prison. Um, the, we worked on Lamont's case for a good while before we actually filed anything in court. And when we decided to file, we decided to file a petition for writ of actual innocence because we thought we had sufficient evidence that he was innocent. That evidence included um, uh, repeated confessions from the actual perpetrator of this robbery, a man who was and is in federal prison for other crimes, including murder. He confessed um, on three separate occasions to lawyers and to detectives that he had committed this robbery. He also said he had never heard of James Lamont Madison um, and that Mr. Madison had nothing to do with this robbery. So we thought, okay, that's a nice confession to have. Um, we also had statements from the victims in the robbery, one of whom said there was nobody as short as Mr. Madison involved in this crime. Um, and the other person who identified Mr. Madison at the time of trial said, um, my identification was basically uh, coerced by the officer that um, was working with me in this case, and that he was never sure of uh, his identification of Mr. Madison, and that the officer gave him information to make him believe that Mr. Madison was in fact the perpetrator. So we had statements from both victims saying, I don't know that guy. Um, and we had statements from the actual perpetrator saying, I did this. I did this with other people. I've never met this guy. He had nothing to do with this crime. Um, we filed our petition for a writ of actual innocence in the Virginia Court of Appeals. We lost. Um, we appealed to the Virginia Supreme Court, and we lost. Um, I have to say I was genuinely shocked. And I'm used to, to losing. I lose most of my cases in my career. Um, hopefully, that's not a comment on my competence, but just my, <laughs> my career choices. Um, but. Uh, I want to start with Lamont, how, how you managed the losses um, uh, when we were in prison, when you were in prison and we were, we were fighting this battle unsuccessfully, and how you managed to stay strong. You were often the cheerleader for me, mm -hmm. um, and so I want you to talk a little bit about how you managed that. Well, you know me, I come from Norfolk, so... I come from the projects, whoever don't know about the projects, that's what they call the lowest of the lowest. So, you know, uh, we always grew up in a struggle. So that kind of strengthened me for life ahead. I never knew it was gonna be prison, but it all is, is built a strength up on the inside that nobody can take from you. You understand? So when they locked me up, wrongfully convicted, there was a loss right there. But I was like him. I just got to get it out. Somebody got to hear it. You understand? Because my family believed me, but I need somebody who's not joined to my family to believe it. So I was writing and writing. I was getting turned down, but it was nothing. I'm used to it. I'm used to the um, getting pushed to the wayside. You understand? So I had that inner strength in me. So finally, when they came to me with the news about, well, let me show you this. In my life, everything, like I said, I come from the struggle. So everything I get, it'd be a blessing. Stuff that go good for me, it don't just come regular. God makes sure he's sure it in a blessing for him. So the judge, he won't believe me because it would have been too easy. So it had to come through them. You understand? So that way when I have my story to tell, I can show how I came from a blessing. So when they came to me and told me about it, they even brought me more news that the dude, out of everything in the world, every place in the world, the guy seen the dude that did it in a club at nighttime. And he would just so happen with his cousin or his family member and said, look, that looked like the dude that robbed me, y'all. 
and just so happened how God so good, the dude knew the dude's name that did it. You understand? So that's how we got the ball rolling, and that's how we found the dude's name. And again, it don't happen for me. The dude admitted to everything. I used to have a mouth full of goals. That was my teeth raggedy. So dude said, oh, they might have got him mixed up with my homeboy with the goals in his mouth. You understand? So the little small stuff like that, that's how I overcame. So that's how I kept my strength, through small stuff. Not big stuff, small stuff. And that's how I survived. So that's why I had the strength to help them. You understand? When she was fighting, she go hard too. They go hard. What's that lady that was with you? Huh? Who that? Juliet? Yeah. Or Juliet there? Juliet. Yeah, she was behind her, helping out. Look, look, go attack them people. They was attacking. <laughs> they was fighting hard, you understand? And like what me and him, we said in the back room, I ain't never had nobody fight hard for me like that. You understand? I ain't never had nobody fight hard for me like that. So that also added on to my stress. So I'm like, oh. So I'm a fighter naturally with on the inside, but now I see somebody out there that's not connected to my family that's going hard, and they hear me, and they believe me. You understand? So that's how I hold my strength together through the whole thing. You feel me? Lamont, do you, when you think about your case and your trial, do you, can you identify anyone or anything that is to blame for that wrongful conviction? Yeah, the system. <laughs> the system wicked. That's why I give thanks for all of y'all that's fighting for criminal justice because the system is wicked. We need y'all. Because people ain't gonna listen to us. Now they got us up here now for y'all to hear us. But besides this, we would have been hidden in the back. You understand? So this is a glorious thing that they got us up here so our voices could be heard. The young lady that was bringing me up here, she was on the phone when somebody called me from prison and their voice can't be heard. But she was right there to hear the man um, um, voice heard. He's an innocent person. But he can't, where we come from, even if he don't do it, you can't tell on the one that did do it. So you still got to get the repercussions. You understand? This man cr crying from prison, behind prison walls right now, on our way up here, talking on the phone like, yo, can you talk to Jennifer when you get there? You understand? So that's how it is, man. We have to be heard. We have to be heard. So whoever could help, man, I urge y'all. And like what the brother said down there, thank God for people like y'all. You understand? Whatever you went through in life, they gave you that strength or whatever that want to fight for criminal justice. We give you thanks for that. You understand? Whatever happened. For real. For real. For real. That's for real. That's for real. So we need y'all. We need y'all. We do. All right, Lamont, this is the last question. You're going to wrap up the program. No pressure. You ready? All right, okay. Lamont, mm -hmm. how have you found life on the outside in the past two months? Well, first and foremost, give thanks to God because I'm free. So that, that over, supersede everything. That supersede everything. So what I'm about to say, I still give thanks for my freedom. But since I've been out, it's been a struggle because I was straight in prison. You understand? But now I come out here in this real world with real stuff going on. You understand? So I always had to take a step back and then look at life again. So every day I got to keep revamping myself to get a call into what's going on out here. Right now, look, I was born in 1975. Somebody had my social security number in 1965. So 10 years before I was born. But I was an illegal dude on the street. So I never knew that. I never had no job or nothing. Now I come out of prison, I can't even use that. They took that social security number from me. So I'm an alien walking around. I don't have no number, no nothing. And I still have to stay focused and remember, I'm free. Free is better than anything. You understand? So that's how I have to live right now. So with their help, I'm trying to get my social security situation straight. I can't even get no real job. I do a little $35 job working in the barber shop. And again, I got blessed because the man don't know me from nowhere, and he just gave me the job. He, made, he gave me a test run, one hit. He's like, oh, you got it? And he gave me the keys the next day to the barber shop. Trust, only God alone can do that. Jeez. You see me? <laughs> so we need y'all. Help us, please. And there's still voices that need to be heard, too. Because we ain't, ain't going to be the first or the last. You understand? Y'all going to be like, damn, that many people. Because there's going to be some after this, too, and some after that, too. 
but with your ears and our voice, it could get done. You see me? Bless it. Thank you, Ramon. I want to thank you all for being here. We're very grateful. Um, it is a really extraordinary thing to have all of these clients, nine clients here, um, to tell their stories. It's, it's pretty extraordinary um, to look across this room and see all these faces. Um, I want to thank our sponsors, some law firms who very generously donated, Reed Smith, Baker Botts, Troutman Pepper, Debevoise and Plimpton, White and Case, and Themis Bar Review. Uh, we are very, very grateful for them for sponsoring uh, this event. Um, and I want to thank McGuire Woods as well, which has donated hundreds if not thousands of pro bono hours to Gilbert Merritt and Arsene Hicks's case. Um, so I'm going to let you all go. Please notice there are QR codes um, if you would like to donate through Cash App. It's very easy. I believe there are a couple of shoe boxes back there waving women with shoe boxes uh, and some men. Uh, so they can help you out with um, writing checks or giving cash. We take all forms of currency here. Um, we're very appreciative. I just want to add that we have 14 students in our academic clinic and about 70 students volunteering for our pro bono clinic. The pro bono clinic is what we're raising funds for. Serena has been the attorney overseeing that um, this past year. Um, I, I was in Serena's job for the two years before her. Uh, we wouldn't have an attorney to oversee those 70 students who want to volunteer their time, if not for donations. So we are enormously grateful, and thank you all for being here. <laughs>